Since a lot of my plans have curtailed due to lots of rain, I kid you not, it has rained every Friday and or Saturday for the past six months here, I figured why not settle down indoors and talk about the simple stuff. And I mean the really simple stuff. You see, something I see a lot of is people getting overwhelmed by a lot of the RC world, especially the racing world. Things can get complicated very fast. So in this video, that hopefully becomes a series, I'm going to be breaking down the absolute basics of RC, with this particular video going over the car, or buggy in this case. Before we begin, I'd like to say that if you're at all adept in the world of RC racing, chances are this video will have very little for you. However, if you're new and want to learn stuff you may be too embarrassed to ask someone in person, grab a pen and paper or open up one moat and be ready, as in this video we'll be examining the basics of a buggy and using different cars from my current fleet to use as a reference, mostly 10th scale. Before we begin, however, I'd like to take this time to remind you to subscribe to the channel and be sure to like the video if you enjoy it. With that out of the way, let's get started. Let's begin with the outer parts of the car and work our way in, and that leaves us with the wheels and tires. Now I'm not going to go too in depth as to what tires to choose. What I will do is show you the different parts that make up the wheel itself. From the outside in, first we have the tire itself, or rubber if you prefer. This is what actually contacts the ground when driving as you can see. There are many different tread styles out there for different tracks and track surfaces, but the most common one you're going to find for indoor 10th scale racing will be a slick tire, specifically indoor dirt in the US. I know it sounds weird to use a slick tire on dirt, but with these surfaces we have now, it makes a lot of sense. I did a video explaining all of that, so feel free to check that out. The other thing that take into account with the rubber of the tire is the compound. Pretty much every tire company has their own chart for the compound of their tires, so if you want a quick refresher as to what compound to use for which application, I would say check out my previous video on tires, but to be honest I could have done that video much better, so I do plan on redoing that particular video with more visual aid very soon. Probably the next video to be honest with you. But I'm getting sidetracked. When buying tires, make sure to match up which tire you want to use for the part you need. For 8 scale buggies there's no front or rear tire specifically, but with 10 scale vehicles there are. There are also differences between 4 wheel drive fronts and 2 wheel drive fronts so keep that in mind for later. Next up we have the foams on the inside. In the world of RC, having air in the tires can be very much hit or miss, especially considering how we mount them. So instead we use foam as a substitute. When you buy tires these days, they're almost always bundled up with a set of foams to go with them. How stiff the foams are kind of works the same way as air pressure would in a full size car. Stiffer foams would work like higher air pressure and softer foams would work like lower air pressure. There are also two main types of foams normally used today in the world of RC racing. Closed cell foams and open cell foams. Open cell foams are generally used with carpet and turf tires, whereas closed cell foams are used for dirt tires. There are many different things people do to foams and tires to get more grip, but we won't focus on that for now. For now, let's move on to the wheels or rims if you prefer. In the world of RC off-road racing, wheels are pretty much always solid dish style wheels like this to give the maximum strength. Along with that when buying wheels, it's important to note a couple different things. First off is offset. Different cars have different wheel offsets that need to be taken into account. Otherwise, your car at best won't perform well, or at worst, your wheels won't fit and you'll have wasted a set of tires and wheels. The offset of a wheel is when you buy it is usually listed either on the item description online or for the actual packaging itself. For example, these wheels will work on an Associated, X-Ray, and Yokomo, but won't work for a Low C or Techno. Make sure you always double check what wheels you're buying and what offset they are for as well. Another thing to take into account, specifically for two-wheel drive buggy, is what surface you're racing on. For dirt style tracks, you'll always want to buy standard size front wheels for uh, wheels, but for carpet and turf, you're going to want to grab yourself a slim front wheel and tire. Trust me, it will make the car much more manageable. For 8th scale, you won't have to worry too much about offset as it's pretty much standard across the entirety of the 8th scale world. What is important is matching up the wheels with tire brands themselves. This is entirely due to how their wheels are designed and how they want you to glue them. You can't glue Proline or J-Concept tires to Ogo wheels for example and vice versa. With that out of the way, 
Let's move inward to something very important, camber links. These right here are camber links. They mount up to the hubs and allow you to change your camber. What is camber? Well, it's basically this. No, wait, this. It's how far your wheels and tires lean over. This is a negative camber and this is positive camber. You almost never want positive camber unless you're doing dirt oval racing and I'm not even sure there it's needed. So we'll focus on negative camber for now. You set your camber by plopping your car on a flat level surface, taking a turnbuckle wrench and a camber gauge and measuring the wheels like this. Adjust the turnbuckles accordingly and there you go. You have now set your camber. This system is different on pillow ball 8 scale vehicles, but pretty much just involves spacers so don't worry too much about it. Another thing to note in this general area, particularly in my four wheel drive vehicles, would be these right here. These are sway bars, or more accurately, anti-roll anti bars. They help the car resist rolling under hard quartering. Generally, these are mostly used on higher tracks and surfaces on two wheel drive cars and everywhere on four wheel drive ones. Also, on higher tracks and surfaces, the anti-roll bars tend to be a lot stiffer. Whenever you turn in any four-wheel drive car, or any four-wheel car for that matter, the two wheels on opposite sides must spin at different rates. The inner wheel spins less, the outer wheel spins more. If you simply had a lock diff or no diff at all, it would be great for drifting and spinning out, but not much else. That's why in the world of RC racing, there are two main types of diffs. One for dirt two-wheel drive vehicles, and one for everything else. Let's start with the two-wheel drive dirt diffs, more commonly known as a ball diff. The ball diff works pretty much the same as a regular diff would, except for in its method of doing so. With a ball diff, you have a bunch of metal balls encased in a diff gear which in itself is sandwiched by two metal pieces that are molded into the outdrives. In the middle of those is a screw that holds the two metal outdrives together, and how tight that screw is tightened determines how resistive that differential is. Most of the time for indoor tracks, you're going to want it pretty tight, so keep that in mind for when you're building it. Now for the other type of diff, you have a gear diff. These are used on high tracks and surfaces like turf or carpet for two-wheel drive vehicles and everywhere for four-wheel drive vehicles. Also, unlike two-wheel drive vehicles, on four-wheel drive vehicles you have more than one differential, usually three but sometimes two with a slipper clutch, but I'm getting ahead of myself again. With gear diffs in the RC world, they are usually filled with silicone oil. How thick that oil is determines how resistive the differential is. With diff oil, probably the most important tuning tools of your car, the shocks are your second line of defense against bumps in the track, help keep your car firmly planted to the ground, and keep it from bottoming out on jumps. The shock is made of multiple different components, so let's break them down. First we have the shock body. This is the outer shell part of the shock itself and is what holds the shock oil inside. Next we have the shock shaft and piston. The shaft is what guides and holds the piston inside of the shock body, and the piston itself is what allows the shock to do the oil dampening thing. Okay, for a better explanation of the oil dampening thing, the piston itself has holes in it that only allow a certain amount of oil to go through at a time. The thicker the oil and or smaller slash less holes there are, the slower the piston will move up and down. The thinner the oil and or larger more holes there are in the piston, the faster the piston will move up and down. Next up we have the spring itself. This is what allows the shock to rebound after compressing and it's what more or less holds your car off the ground. Another thing to note about shocks is that it, what it allows you to set your ride height via preload. You do this by using threads on the shock body to move the spring holder up and down to adjust the preload. The lower the spring holder is on the shock body is, the more preload there will be and thus the higher your ride height will be and vice versa. Another thing to note about shocks is that there are two, two different types, emulsion and bladder shocks. Bladder shocks usually come in 8 scale kits and are made for longer jumps, and emulsion shocks are usually came in 10 scale kits for smaller less demanding tracks. Next up we have a good old fashioned slipper clutch. A slipper clutch has two jobs, to smooth out power delivery and save the driveline from damage, especially on high traction surfaces with mod motors in 2 wheel drive and 4 wheel drive vehicles. As if you run direct drive with a mod motor, bad things will happen. Okay, it's hard to explain in detail as to how the slipper clutch works, so let me see if I can give it a shot. There. If you wish to know what I said, just remember what I said previously in slow motion. 
now that we got the important stuff out of the way regarding the chassis, wheels, and suspension, why don't we go over the electronics and exactly what they do, starting with the motor. When it comes to 10th scale motors in the racing world, they are usually measured in terms of a system called a turn rating. I won't get into detail as to what turns actually entail, but what I will say is that the lower the turn rating, the more powerful the motor is. This is why you'll see lots of drag cars running motors as low as 3.5 turns. These two associated buggies are both running 6.5 turn motors and that's about as far as you want to go if not a bit further than you want to go as both of my cars are really turned down in terms of power level. Also when searching for motors and for 10th scale racing vehicles, always go for 540 size motors as those are what are both race legal and what 99% of the cars are built for. It's also important to note that all motors used for racing these days are indeed brushless motors. Brushed motors outside of spec classes are pretty rare these days. Connected to the motor, via some, in this case, jank soldering, is the ESC. The ESC, or Electronic Speed Controller's job is to modulate the throttle and electric power to other parts of the car, like the receiver, and by extension, everything the receiver is connected to. We'll get to that shy little thing in a bit. 10 scale ESCs come in a few different flavors I'd like to call I'm a normal human being, I'm infected, I've made mistakes, and I have too much money. We'll call them D, C, B, and A respectively. Now D class ESCs for 10 scales are your quick run ESCs from hobby wing types and are perfectly fine ESCs for general running but aren't roar proof for stock racing. C class ESCs are your 60 amp stock ESCs just like the just stock ESC from hobby wing or the 60 amp stock spec ESC from Reedy. These ESCs are roar proof for blinky mode, or basically stock mode, where the light on the ESC blinks, hence the term blinky mode, and usually are pretty basic in their functions. For more hardcore stock racers, you have B class ESCs. These ESCs come with the bells and whistles that an A class ESC would come with without the ability to run on any motor below 10.5 turns most of the time. And lastly, we have the A-Class ESCs. These ESCs are usually able to handle anything down to 3.5 turns for extended periods of time, and also able to be tuned to perfection for the user if need be. Also, if you wish to use it for blinking or stock mode, Roar has approved it, so you should need, shouldn't need to change it for stock racing. It is important to note that all 10 scale ESCs are rated almost exclusively for 2S LiPo batteries. 8 scale ESCs are rated for 4S for racing, as that's what is mandated by the big man upstairs. Next up, we have the battery. This is what powers your ESC and by extension, everything on your car. I've done a video on batteries before and I will be linking that in the top part of this video, but there are a few crucial things to note about 10 scale batteries when it comes to off-road. First, no matter what car you buy, all modern design two-wheel drive buggies, four-wheel drive buggies, short course trucks, stadium trucks, and even mini truggies will be using 2S batteries in the shorty configuration. Secondly, anything above 5,000 mAh on a 10 scale pack is more or less unnecessary as you'll more or less be, be packing on extra weight. Thirdly, there are two different types of LiPo batteries being sold these days, with those being regular LiPo batteries and high voltage or HV batteries. High voltage batteries have a bit more punch than regular LiPos, but usually aren't allowed for stock racing most of the time. Also, never, and I mean never, charge a LiPo battery of high voltage. It will blow up. Fourthly, there are also two different types of shorty configurations. LCG, or low center of gravity, and regular. Low center of gravity batteries are usually used more often as they save weight. I would show you the difference between the two, but it takes a while to ship batteries due to, well, aforementioned reasons. Next up, we have the servo. This is basically what steers the car. Now, there are a few different types of servos, but the one used in both 10th and 8th scale are 99% of the time are going to be your standard size servos. Don't get too comfortable though, as there are still some different types of servos out there usually labeled by speed and torque. Speed is how fast the servo moves, whereas torque is how much force it can move an object with. Generally, the bigger and heavier your front tires are, the more torque your servo needs to have but the smaller your front tires are, the faster your servo should be. You can run a torque servo in a two-wheel drive buggy just fine, but you can't really run a high profile or low profile high speed servo on a truggy and expect it to survive. 
This Savox 1258 TG Standard Edition is no longer being made to my knowledge, but the Black Edition is, so if you're in the market for a servo for a tent scale, those are probably your best bet. Something else to take into account is that the spline or servo horn holder usually has a different amount of teeth depending on the brand of the servo you're using. Savox and most other brands use 25 teeth splines, but be sure to check the actual labeling on how many teeth the spline has on your servo so you can buy the right horn. Next up we have the receiver itself. Don't be intimidated by the high number of letters and numbers, they don't mean much to us for now. All you really need to know is that when you're buying a radio and receiver, you of course need to match the brands to make things easier. Futaba goes with Futaba receivers and Flysky goes with Flysky, so on and so forth. Each one has a different binding procedure that needs to be followed and they're all in the manual of both your receiver and radio. As for the order that the other electronics need to be plugged into, your servo always goes into channel 1 and your ESC or electronic speed controller always goes into channel 2. Other than that, it's free game as to where you want to plug things in. Oh, and another thing to keep in mind is this. This is a transponder. Quite expensive these things are, and they are what allow you to record laps. If you have the funds to buy the RC4 2 wild transponder, then that would be the one to get as they work on the most amount of mylapse timing systems used around the world. However, I have yet to run into a situation where my transponder didn't work and I have the three wire one. And those are the absolute basics of the important stuff you need to know about an RC racing car. If you made it this far, I really appreciate you. If you enjoyed the video and found it helpful at all, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed and would like to see more. And if you have any questions you'd like to ask, be sure to go ahead and list them in the comment section below no matter how basic you think it might be. I'm here to help, not ridicule. If you want to help out the channel, you can also check out my Patreon, where I post updates and teasers to my upgutting videos before they release. Speaking of which, I'd like to thank my patrons Michael Williams, RC World Discord server, Casey Nix, Ben Reeves, Dave Armstrong, Joe Jenkins, The Mailman 110, Rob Bettingfield, Caden Merckx, Rong Chang, and especially Morrison Watt. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.